Okay. Uh, so hello everybody. Um, first, uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to thank you for this invitation to the to the seminar uh, of the PCMA. I'm really happy to to share uh, the result of both part of the result of uh, the Desert Network project and uh, part of the result of the French mission in the Eastern Desert of Egypt. Uh, the mission is uh, supported and funded by the French Ministry of Europe and Foreign Affairs, the uh, IFAO, the CNRS, mainly through uh, ISOMA Research Lab these last years, and have received also financial support from the RC project Desert Networks, directed by Béranger Redon between uh, 2017 and 2022. It also involves many researchers, uh, several dozen of them from different research institutions since the beginning of the mission as well as many workers from <coughs> Gourna. Uh, the mission has still the word French in its name, but the team is now really international, uh, with French, German, American, Swiss, Greek, and Egyptian members. All the results presented here are obviously the result of a collective effort, and I would therefore like to begin uh, by thanking the workers, and in particular, their Raiz, Baghdadi Mohamed Abdallah, who have worked with the mission for many years, and of course, all the doctoral students, engineers, and researchers who have contributed to the diversity of the studies carried out, carried out on the sites. Uh, first, uh, the outlines of the presentation. I will talk for a few minutes about the environmental context of the Eastern Desert of Egypt. Then I will present you the history of uh, the MAVDO and the Desert, Network, uh, Desert Networks project. And then I will go on uh, to the Desert Network's contribution to the study of water and roads at a regional scale, because it has been something that helped us a lot uh, recently. In fact, this project, we had the opportunity to gather a lot of data. And uh, then the result of the work of the MAVDO in Goza and Der Latrache, the site we are excavating since 2020. Uh, first, regarding the climate, here is a climatic map of the Sahara. So the eastern desert of Egypt is in this area, where, as you can see, there is really few uh, rain uh, rainfall, and uh, where there is no clear seasonality of rainfall, which is uh, something uh, important. Uh, the mean annual rainfall is, uh, after Mbabi uh, 2004, between 50 and less than two millimeters uh, per year. Uh, according to the position in the desert, the north is uh, more rainy, the south is more dry, and the west is more dry, and the east is more rainy. There is less than five millimeters by year in most of the studied area, with a very high temporal and spatial variability of rain event. It means that there is no perennial water stream, but still some flows, as you can see on this picture, uh, took uh, near Xeron Pelagos uh, a few years ago. Uh, this uh, arid to hyperarid climate is not something new. Uh, it starts at the end of what we call the North, the North Gripian stage. So uh, before, before the, the exact stage we are right now. So in the Middle Ocean, in fact, it started. Uh, around uh, 3500 BC. And we are quite sure that the aridity was similar to present day conditions since at least uh, five millennia. So uh, in this context, underground water resources are really important. And in Egypt, we have six main aquifers, uh, Nubia Samson aquifer system, carbonate aquifer system, uh, also called post-Nubian, Mogra Basin Aquifer, Basement Complex Aquifer, Coastal Aquifers, and the Nile Aquifer. Those, uh, as I put in, uh, in uh, yeah, you see, uh, are the one um, in bold, sorry, are the, the ones that concern the Eastern Desert of Egypt. Uh, so we have four different types of aquifer, or more generally, big aquifers in this area. The most important are the Nubian Samson aquifer system, uh, which you can see in, uh, in yellow. Uh, this one is really important because, in fact, there is some part of it that is artesian. That means that water will go up to the topographic surface, making uh, the, creating some springs. Uh, 
and there is a well documented uh, decrease in the water volume uh, contained in this aquifer since at least uh, seven millennia, uh, which means that there is less and less water in this aquifer and that we went from natural flowing springs and traditional wells during the antiquity to pumping station nowadays. And a long time, it goes lower and lower and lower. And uh, the, there is only water in the lower areas. But in the past, you can uh, you you would have had springs in uh, upper part also. Uh, for the basement complex aquifer, there is a shorter time of discharge and recharge uh, because it's still something that can have some recharge right now whereas the Nubian Sanson aquifer system does not have any research. Uh, but there is still a general drawdown of the water in some parts since at least the Roman period. In fact, when you are uh, lowering a uh, Nubian Sanson aquifer system after a threshold, the basement complex starts to put its water inside the Nubian Sanson aquifer system. And basically, these two major this is three, in fact, because it's also the case for the post-Nubian. You have the post-Nubian and the basement complex uh, putting the water inside the Nubian sandstone aquifer system. And thus, most part of Egypt are just emptying uh, from the underground water uh, since, uh, since uh, seven millennia. There is still some local uh, groundwater on springs after rainfall uh, in the basement complex area. Uh, so, because of uh, this, uh, this water, uh, there, is, uh, some, uh, there is a huge diversity, in fact, of uh, landscape and environments from woody areas that can be uh, several uh, hectares wide to kind of absolute desert, but with a lot of intermediate situation. Uh, so this desert is not the same everywhere, of course. Uh, and it's uh, one of the things that make it very difficult to 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 study because you always have to check if there is no uh, specific feature at this place which make water from the underground uh, being closer to the surface and this kind of thing. But uh, I will go to the question of the history of the French mission in the Eastern Desert. So. Uh, this mission uh, started in 1994 under the direction of Hélène Cuvigny. It was initially, initially focused on Roman quarries and roads with excavation along the road of Copto, from Coptos to Myosormos uh, and the road from Coptos to Berenike and also in a quarry near Porphyrites, the quarry of Umbalad. Uh, no, um, almost 30 years after, uh, it's uh, 19 sites that the mission has excavated uh, or study. Uh, in uh, 2013, Béranger Redon became uh, the new director. The focus shifts to Ptolemaic gold mines and roads with uh, excavation in uh, the Samut district and the diachronic study of gold mining activity since New Kingdom to early Islamic. Uh, in uh, 2018, Thomas Fauché replaced her as director and uh, the excavation in uh, Abad uh, happened with uh, starting a few years later because we had some trouble to have authorization in some other forts such as Abu Hal or Abu Midrik and Abu Midrik. Uh, we shifted our uh, interest area more to the north uh, in the Goza district, so in this area. Uh, I took the direction of the mission uh, in uh, between 2022 and 2023, and uh, the excavation in Goza district are still ongoing with a diachronic uh, study of the area. Uh, since uh, 2013, the work of the mission has taken on the character of a kind of rescue excavation, given the extent to which uh, destruction in the region has affected the archaeological heritage. Unfortunately, the mining sites in the Eastern Desert have suffered major destruction, leaving little place for future study. The Bir Samut site, for example, which we excavated be between 2013 and 2016, has been completely destroyed uh, by bulldozers since the end of our work. 
The last 10 years have seen a great deal of irreversible destruction, and it is likely, in fact, that the study of gold mining archaeology in Egypt uh, is in its twilight. It's likely that it is the same in Sudan, unfortunately. And uh, this is uh, all the more sad, given that the same observation can be made for the whole of the African continent and the African uh, desert right now, uh, with the new uh, rise in gold prices. Uh, we cannot expect uh, any improvement of the situation, unfortunately. Uh, so, uh, short presentation of the Desert Network project. Uh, desert Networks into the Eastern Desert of Egypt from the New Kingdom to the Roman period to have the complete title of the project. It was a project directed by uh, Béranger Redon during five years and funded by the European Council uh, Research Council. Uh, it used a methodology based on a study over the long durée, gathering and confronting archaeological material and written evidence, as well as, as geoarchaeological and environmental data. It relies on a network approach uh, and connectivity theory. The main research topic was uh, network nature with physical networks, economic networks, and social networks, and their evolution over time and through uh, shiftings of uh, both the geography and the perceptions. The aims was, were mainly global to, to write a global history of the Eastern Desert from Pharaonic to Roman time, focused really on the dynamics of the desert, in linked with the Nile and the Red Sea, of course, but focused on the desert and uh, to produce also an online atlas of the Eastern Desert sites from the New Kingdom to the Roman period. The main output, as it is right now, but more will come, of course. The online atlas, this online database, database sorry, is available. Uh, you can have uh, on this website, uh, Gazetteur of Sites, uh, with an interactive maps of the different sites, uh, including also subsites, watering places, uh, some uh, itineraries, data about geology of the Eastern Desert. So it's, uh, I think it's a tool that can be uh, useful to anyone who wants to start uh, to study the Eastern Desert or to, to do a more regional study. Uh, there is also some data about uh, finds, about alimentation, and about the many missions and travelers that worked or are still working uh, in the Eastern Desert as well as some uh, bibliographical data and a lot of uh, images that has been uh, made available to, to anyone thanks to, to the website. Uh, we also built uh, together with uh, Béranger Redon and Louis Manière, uh, CAMEL, uh, List Coast Pass Networks and GIS tool. I will uh, come back to this in a few minutes. And we had uh, new insights regarding uh, food related practices and water management, as well as several uh, successful PhDs and postdocs uh, in the project. And I, uh, I take the opportunity of this uh, presentation to, to thank again uh, Béranger Redon, who trusted me uh, in this project. And that allowed me to, to work about uh, water management on a regional uh, scale which is the thing that allowed me to understand how water is working in the Easter Desert, really. So uh, some uh, results about, um, about uh, this uh, water management uh, study. First, it's a research which has been based on Greco-Roman archaeological and textual data in uh, collaboration with Béranger Redon, Hélène Cuvigny and Marie-Pierre Chauffray. Uh, the analysis of a dozen of travelers' accounts uh, between the 18th and the 20th century, and uh, topographical and geographical maps uh, information uh, gathered by Alexandre Rabot. Uh, using all these things, I was able to recognize six main types of uh, watering places, wadis and, and temporary lakes, wetlands, kilat, springs, uh, semi-artificial water intakes, and wells. I will tell you more in a, in a few seconds. And uh, I was quite surprised in uh, such an arid desert to have many more superficial resources uh, used and uh, mentioned than, uh, than I thought before, especially uh, not, not so many wadis and temporary relays, but wetlands and kilat are uh, more widespread than I used to think. 
I also realized that there is different use and different networks of watering places between the nomads uh, one and the sedentary ones. Uh, they don't really like the same kind of watering places. A uh, short remark about uh, the map. Uh, most of the un unknown types uh, dot are in fact most probably cult or springs or one of the kind of the wells I will describe later, which are wells that are really short lived and you dig it again anytime you need a well in this area. Uh, this is why, in fact, we can't see anything on satellite imagery and sometimes we can't see anything on the field if we don't know exactly where to go. Uh, so uh, regarding the, the wadis, the lake and wetlands. First, the water of the wadis are, is really rarely mentioned in the accounts of travelers for good reason, because it is rare that they contain any water as they depend exclusively on, uh, except for, for one example I will give you uh, concerning the wetland you, you can see right there. Uh, they depend exclusively on surface water, so on rain, and it's rare to observe water inside. Nevertheless, wadi flow were still observed by, uh, for example, Klunzinger uh, near Kusser and by Scaife at the outlet of the Wadi Kena in March 1934. And in the same years, he also observed flow in the Wadi Al Kiraya several days after a storm. This flow does not necessarily produce water reserves and can be directly exploited on the surface, except in rare overflow basin or when the course of the wadi is interrupted by a natural or man-made obstacle, thus forming a temporary lake. But they still do contribute to recharging alluvial aquifers and to the development of vegetation useful, for example, for pastoralists. Tregenza, for example, cites Wadi Umaraka as an example. There were plenty, I start the, the quotation. There were plenty of Zilla bush for the camel. He, Soliman, a mother traveling with Tregenza, had found water by digging down a meter in the sand. Alexi Bear, uh, 150 years before, also found water under the same condition in Wadi Awashia. Again, the vegetation was highly developed. Concerning wetlands, uh, so you have a lake there because of this higher part at the confluence between this wadi and this one. Uh, and this wetland you have there um, is an opportunity for me to, to, to show you the dual interest of uh, wetlands. It's at the same time a good water resource, at least for animals, and a pasture that is easily, easily renewed because there is water uh, most of the time, these wetlands are linked to springs or to uh, outcrops of the phreatic uh, water. And uh, for example, this one is Birambagi, uh, Ainel Rasal. It's brought about by a spring, and it's also uh, the starting point of a small stream. No, it's only uh, less than 200 meters, but it was around one kilometer and a half uh, in some uh, period of the 19th century. The area is well documented because it is located at an important crossing point uh, where at least four roads connecting the Nile Valley to the Red Sea meet between Birbeida, Biral Inglis, and the port of Kusser, near Sormos. Uh, the description are therefore particularly rich. And for example, Klunzinger, who lived for several years in Kusser, describes the wetlands in his book in uh, 1878. The springs that here and there occur have a very bitter taste and sometimes give out a smell that, like that of sulfurated hydrogen. hydrogen. In place, the soil appears loose, crusty, yellowish, moist, as it were, spongy, and impregnated with a saline <coughs> fluid. A bitter perennial rivulet, the Ambagi, makes a vain attempt to trickle further down into the valley and gives a verdant existence to a grove of bushes of bushes after but after a few days rain before becomes a few days rain <clears throat> it becomes a raging devastating stream today there is still uh, 16 hectares of wetlands and vegetation uh, visible on satellite images at Ain and Razal uh, and this uh, its sustainability as well as its proximity to Kusar to Kusar al Kadim 
the ancient uh, Myosomo sport uh, makes it an excellent site uh, for the identification of Pliny the Elder's uh, Inos or Tidnos fonts. Uh, more to the north, another spring fed wetland of much narrow extent uh, has been testified by Baron and Hume at the end of the 19th century in Abouchar el Kibli, uh, which was still a Roman fort uh, on the well, probably of the same date. date. The site uh, was long identified as Tadnos Fons, uh, mentioned, mentioned above, due to the wrong identification of the nearby, nearby site, Abouchar, uh, as Myosormos. Uh, for no, no ancient name can be associated with Abouchar al Kibli, and the analysis of satellite images shows that it no longer exists uh, and has no, no been replaced by cultivated lands. Uh, concerning the artificial or semi artificial water intakes, there, are, there is only one type of water intake uh, observed in the Eastern Desert by travelers and early scholars uh, only during the 20th century. It's under the form of dams and um, constructed bypasses designed to divert wadi fluid uh, water to close depression. Fregenza explains it's this as follows. By building a dam of wadi boulders and gravel, he had trapped a local flow of rainwater. With it, had flooded, mm. and with it had flooded a wide bay of sand in the outer, outer hills. He had thus been able to sow watermelon seeds and millet over an area of several acres, and his people were now harvesting the crop. When we check on current satellite imagery, uh, we can see that this method is still in use, although uh, dams uh, made from wadi alluvium are largely replaced now by trenches or levee made uh, with baku loaders. However, uh, it's still uh, something that it's not so widespread. Uh, but it seems that we have this kind of uh, basin in the vicinity of, of Wadi, which you can use like that uh, in uh, several places where the Ostraka mentioned uh, uh, desertic uh, agriculture during uh, the Roman period, especially. Uh, regarding springs, uh, there is a lot of mention of springs in the traveler's account. But most of them are no, now uh, totally dry. Uh, they were sometimes useful in the past. And for example, uh, there was even some springs with which you can have small oases. For example, at Birabu Safa, where uh, Linon de Belfond observed one in uh, 1832. Uh, the spring is located in the immediate vicinity of the famous uh, facade curved into the rock and dated back to Ptolemy III Evergetes, uh, more precisely 228-227 uh, uh, BC. Um, we have several descriptions of huge source springs, for example, uh, Amusne Springs or Umsue Springs. In the 19th century, many people, many travelers talk about that. And Belzoni had his uh, caravan uh, staying there for a few days, in fact, because there was in really, really need for rest and uh, water. And they spent a few days there without any problem. Uh, when the um, when the French expedition in Egypt went from the Nile Valley to Kusser also, they used uh, several springs along the, the road, but the springs were not sufficient for all, uh, all the caravan, which is not surprising because it was more than 1,000 people, each one with a camel. So it was really huge and too much for the environment. And finally, uh, I will speak about Kilat or Kalt uh, in singular. A Kalt is a natural basin, sometimes slightly modified by human intervention, with an impermeable or low permeability rocky bottom that fills with water during rainfall uh, because of concentration of local runoff. Uh, and sometimes there is also some springs filling them. Uh, Except in the, latter, in the latter case, it generally does not contain water permanently due to evaporation. 
However, when a cult in this sufficient tea shelters from the sun, it constitutes a water resource for several months or years. And references to such features in the traveler's account are so numerous that it is not possible in the present state of my work to produce an exhaustive list. However, uh, we can still see that it has been used a lot. Uh, uh, and I will speak about one series of kilat uh, we have uh, in the area of uh, Gebel Qatar and Gebel Umdiza, uh, which is Kalt Umdiza. It's this wadi, in fact. We have here a lower basin and here two upper basin. Uh, you will see better in the next, uh, in the next uh, slide. It has been uh, mentioned first by uh, Ernest Ascoy Floyer. Uh, who spotted it in the in uh, 1886 and uh, called it Medizaglen. Uh, he described it as following: It is a steep climb down of four hours from the ridge to the Medizaglen, where is always a plentiful supply of water, both in a natural reservoir with steep sides and full of green water cresses, and from all scrapped in the gravelly bed above. If, however, you follow the, wind, the windings of the Mediza ravine, you will pass over a large basin, one especially large one overgrown with calamus or Arab penreed, which has only dried up in the summer of 8086. It is also mentioned by uh, Baron and Hume uh, slightly later. And um, for, for them, it's uh, they, they surveyed a huge part of the Eastern Desert, and for them, Wadi Qatar, Wadi Umdisa, and Wadi Umanab are the best one for water resource from the surface. And uh, so the upper one is this one, and the upper one is this one in 2020. Uh, 2022, sorry. Several, uh, several years after the last big rains, you have still a lot of water inside of it, and you are still in the lower part in this area, uh, some uh, baby catfish uh, living inside. And unfortunately, I don't have any picture, but some adults in the bigger one. So you can have, even with around 10 years without water, uh, some water still there in the kilat and some fishes even uh, living there. Um, and last type of watering place, of course, the wells. It's the first thing we have in mind when we are thinking about watering place in the desert, but it's in fact not the most important for everybody. For example, uh, the deep and built wells are the most important most of the time for the sedentary people who just need to be sure to have water. Even if it's hard to take it from the ground, it's not a problem. Uh, they will build a big system. They will have a shadow for sh or sakya and they will use it. But it's not the best for the nomadic people. And nomadic people uh, more usually use uh, shallow wells, which are just really, really shallow wells. They dug every time they need uh, in uh, Wadi Alluvium most of the time. You can also have naturally protected wells, which are naturally protected either by big blocks of rocks or by a higher position in the Wadi slopes. And finally, artificially protected wells, uh, such as this one in El Sakia, you have the big well there, and a rubble heap uh, put there just to make sure that it is not uh, filled in by the flood with uh, heavily destroyed uh, and looted uh, Roman fort there. Uh, concerning the wells, I think this. Uh, extract from John Ball in 1912 is very important to understand how people from the desert, nomad from the desert, use the wells and how, in fact, they rely mostly on surface water uh, before using underground water. After every considerable rainfall, the wells become filled up with stony downwash uh, and have to be dug out, dug out afresh. There is no protective wall to prevent infillings, and contrary to what Mike might at first be thought, it is not laziness which conditions this circumstance. To the Arab, wells are last resource. 
after rain, of the gulfs, rock basins, are full of good, of good water. The Arab knows that the supplies in these gulfs will evaporate, while those in the wells covered, by, covered in by alluvium are safe from loss by this cause. He therefore draws his supplies from gulfs as long as he can, and only when these are empties does he open the wells. The main wells never fail, except after un unusually prolonged growth, and then the condition of the Arab is sore indeed. Uh, so this is uh, my uh, my conclusion for for the water. It's really different for nomad and sedentary people. They don't use the same kind of uh, of thing, uh, the same kind of uh, watering places. And so about the road, I will be very fast because it's already quite late. Uh, and this is uh, something that we did so with uh, Louis Manier and Béranger Redon. First, we realized that uh, existing uh, Liscos Pass models failed to predict ancient road uh, and modern road used by caravans, including camels. We realized that was because, uh, in fact, uh, camels are, have more constraints on, on their movements than human. And so we had to build a new model. We decided to use a semi-empirical method based on known ancient roads and modern travelers' itineraries. So, for example, some travelers gave us through maps or through their, uh, their accounts information. For example, there I had to go back because it was impossible to cross with a caravan in Bisson de la Roque. Or there, on a map by John Ball, you can see that it is a pass which is steep, but it's still OK. And in other maps, we have some paths which are unpassable with camels. And so we knew that it was 37% of slope, which was the upper limit for camels. So we can use that, but you can also use, as I uh, rebuilt the itineraries of the travelers, of the modern travelers to the exact pass and wadi, uh, you can have, uh, you can extract, in fact, in fact, data from the training pass. Uh, so you can check using a digital elevation model and some kind of some uh, satellite imagery. You can check what are the slopes, what are the kind of uh, surface condition uh, on an area, and recognize what are the main uh, factors for displacement uh, movement with camels. So we recognize that it was surface terrain, uh, navigation, because it's harder to find your way in some area. Uh, and in this part, you will try to follow the wadi even if it makes you, even if it makes your travel longer. longer. Uh, there is a topographical uh, factor, of course, and we use also the infrastructure, so the different sites and the water, uh, the watering place to understand uh, where they went through. After that, we, Louis Manier calibrated the cost grids uh, thanks to the training data sets. And when it succeeded in uh, recreating, rebuilding the itinerary from the validation data set, data set, we used it. And the result is this uh, theoretical um, uh, Liscos Pass uh, network adapted to uh, caravan with camels. And it's theoretical, but it works because we, we are able to, to find, uh, even if it's not exactly at the right place, here it's at the right place. It's, here it's several, um, several, hundreds, several hundred meters uh, to the east, but still, it's something that helped us a lot to find new uh, parts of ancient roads uh, never saw before and never documented before. Uh, so this was what the, the two main uh, outputs of desert networks I was involved on. There is uh, much more uh, in the project, uh, and I can just tell you to, to check the website. Uh, I, I really think that everybody can find some interesting thing on this way, website right now because 
we really gathered a lot of things uh, from the bibliography, from the satellite images, from uh, from the field. And uh, this is a tool which is made to be used by anybody <laughs> and everybody. Uh, so to go to uh, the sites and to come back to a more local area. So it's in this area, Goza and Der Latrache. Uh, we, we started there, uh, so in 2020. The site of Goza was not unknown to modern historiography. Uh, there was, for example, an initial visit by Giovanni Brocchi uh, in uh, 1823. But it's mostly uh, Fernand Bisson de la Roque who was the first to really recognize the importance of the site and its link with the gold mines in uh, 1922. Also, he only spent a day on the site. He had time to visit both the village and the mines to draw up a rough map and even to take the first known pictures of the site, which I studied last year at the IFA. It was not until much later in the 90s uh, that the team led by Stephen Sidebottom drew up a more precise map of the site. Before we look at the sites in particular, we're going to explore for a short time the area <coughs> around uh, Wadi Goza. Uh, as it's a wall mining district extending over more than 100 square kilometers around the main site. Surveys of the mining site have been carried out by uh, Marcos Vaxevanopoulos, Thomas Fauché, Alexandre Rabot, uh, Darcy Acclair, and myself uh, in 2020, 2022, and 2023. The research focused mainly on the veins closest to the, to the site, uh, 800 meters at the crow flies to the northeast and done a series of tunnel and installation four kilometers to the sources. But as you can see, there are much more uh, mine entrances in the area. Uh, the, <coughs> survey, the surveys revealed the broad chronological period during which the mines were exploited from at least the New Kingdom to the early medieval period. In addition to the huts scattered in several places, it is above all the works of the, on the veins that is still visible, often accompanied by our underground galleries. This mine shaft provides access to an underground network that probably dates back to the Ptolemaic period. In zone eight, one of the galleries was excavated and yielded a small amount of material, such as rolled fabric that probably found, uh, uh, were used with oil lumps, a fragment of iron tools, and an ostracon in Greek. Uh, probably lost by one of the last miners on the site. In zone 9, an even more complex system of galleries was formed. With three entrances on the crest of the hill, it descended to a depth of uh, 18 meters below surface level. And in this network, two baskets filled with quartz ore were found under scree, probably lost by the miners. The, uh, the exceptional state of preservation is due to the humidity levels in the gallery, which are close to zero. The size of the heaps and the recurrence of work in this area gives an, uh, an idea of the strategic importance of this mining district during ancient time, which until now has been completely underestimated since, since it does not even appear in the list of gold mines compiled by the claim. However, surveys of the entire area still need to be completed, uh, and it will be probably next year, in order to determine its extent, its exact extent, even if the destruction of the veins prevents uh, access to the gallery networks in some part, uh, which were still barely intact uh, around 10 years ago. In years after years, it's worse and worse, unfortunately. Um, there is also some uh, local information. You already know these uh, two documents, but uh, it's from uh, Goza area. So, and uh, we can say that this area is really something uh, good for for water and for cultivation. Of and for example, this um, this uh, this one is very interesting for me because. The wall there is cut in many areas, but more importantly, this wadi fan has been totally transformed by the presence of the wall. So it means that the wall is not something only for the last two or three centuries, but it's much older because in this kind of area to transform uh, and create a new fan, you need a lot of time. 
and I went in the field this year and I found this wall. So this wall, I, I recognize at least three different phases of construction with different with distinct architecture. And I did some uh, undergear drilling in this area. And uh, there is a huge uh, sedimentary column uh, with a trace of uh, cultivation. And it means that it's at least uh, several centuries old. And I think it's several millennia old. And I really hope that we will be able to, to, refine, uh, to refine the dating uh, in the future. Um, so this mine uh, and this environment uh, is the general district in which you find a village occupied in the Ptolemaic period. And this village extends over, over 170 meters in length and 40 meters in width. Uh, excavation were, were carried out in 2020, 2022, and 2023 on six sectors of the village to the west and east. So we now have a good idea of the morphology of the settlement and work area. Also, there are significant differences between the two ends of the village in terms of both structures and the uses the use made, <coughs> made of them, sorry. First, in 2020, Béranger Redon uncovered a basin complex in the westernmost part of the village. Also limited in surface, uh, around 45 square meters, this building includes three base, basin room, a changing room, and other room inside the building associating with its operation. It's extremely well preserved, as you can see, with the start of the vault still visible in most of the room. There is still an elevation of almost two meters. These baths are typical of the bathing establishment of the Ptolemaic period, with two, two rotundas fitted with flat tub, each with a small niche at the top, and two immersion baths. Prior to its abandonment and later reuse as a shelter, the two phases of the building operation date from the, <coughs> the third century BC, uh, as attested by the series three coins found in the demolition. Like the bath at Bir Samut, uh, but of a completely different and more sophisticated model, its construction most likely dates from the very establishment of the village, which raises questions about the diversity of the village population and the planning of the mining facility and their development. To the north of this area, an initial uh, excavation was opened in 2020, focusing first on a large building, the largest in the village, and then on its surrounding. The neat appearance of the large building and the presence of a room in the form of an apse might suggest a chapel or small temple but no elements of worship were discovered in the three rooms that make up the complex. Although, although it is difficult to attribute a function to each room, uh, this part of the village seems to house both work facilities and domestic activities. The material found was often rich in the abandoned layers and gave reason to hope, uh, even if it was the first campaign and the first excavation of the first campaign, uh, that the excavation would uh, yield a large harvest of items of daily life, as well as ostraca. And as you will see, it was indeed the case. Uh, later on in uh, 2022, three new test pits were opened uh, in the village by Darcy Acclay, Béranger Redon, and Thomas Fauché. Uh, the first survey directly to the east of the Bast. Uh, uncovered uh, an imposing part of the village, comprising more than 30 rooms. Uh, and the layer of uh, the abandonment layer uh, in the rooms were generally very rich in material, both uh, pottery and organic. There were some uh, kiln batteries in some area and silos and cooking equipment in other points. Uh, sorry, not kiln battery, uh, oven batteries in some areas and silos and uh, cooking equipment in other points, <coughs> which points, sorry, to the domestic occupation of the area. But there is also quite minor, quartz minor tools and millstones, uh, grindstones, sorry, used uh, to treat the ore. So it seems it's both uh, domestic and mineralogical. At the other end of the village, the zone 38 revealed a different layout with a vestibule opened uh, onto a central space. There were a lot of uh, mastaba against the southern wall of three rooms. 
and um, also uh, something like craftsman workshop in at least three rooms. And we see that this block has a different character from those excavated in the west of the village. There is also a forge uh, that we found there uh, with uh, thick layers of ashes that testified to uh, an intensive use. Uh, there is also, as in most places in the village, two phases of occupation, uh, which are quite clear. Um, another, um, Another complex uh, building at been uh, building complex sorry has been uh, excavated in the north of this area, uh, organized around uh, an inner courtyard. And uh, we the most important thing we found there was in fact uh, the stair you can see on the photogrammetry and the auto photography uh, made from the photogrammetry. Uh, because in this stair, we had uh, several uh, Osaka belonging to uh, somebody called Asclepiades, according to Hélène Cuvigny and Laura Aguerre. We find it at the, at the foot of the, of the steps. Uh, sector 44, excavated by Béranger Redon in uh, 2023, is a large complex with at least 25 rooms. Uh, and the, this campaign shows that, in fact, building uh, 43 West that we just saw and building 44, uh, sector 44 are connected. Uh, there is also two phase of construction with uh, quite well preserved elevation, as you can see. And um, so uh, also uh, you have no, <coughs> another picture, sorry, of a stair. Uh, during, uh, during the second phase, the building is much larger, uh, with 26 rooms divided into two groups. Coming from the west, uh, you have a probable courtyard with oven and fireplaces, and a lot of iron slags were discovered there, and the kind of iron slags that uh, we found is after Marcos Vactevanopoulos proved that it was not only uh, work of iron, but also uh, treatment of iron ore, uh, and so that we have a wall chain operatoire uh, of iron in the village. Um, I will have to skip for the rest, I think, but there is something uh, in another part of the sector 44, I can't skip this, I really can't. Uh, we found uh, shackles, uh, iron shackles uh, in different spots. Uh, this discovery seems to, seems to show that parts of the workers at least uh, that are mentioned in the Osaka were not free and could be either prisoners of slaves, according to Agatha Archides and uh, Agatha Archides, sorry, in his description of the Ptolemaic gold mines of the Wadi Alaki, the people working in the mines were attached with such chains. The presence of prisoners or slave, slaves was not suggested by the Austrian excavation so far, and we have for the moment not located the area where they could have been settled in the village. Uh, and uh, yes, I think I will skip for the rest, but. This, uh, this discovery was a huge surprise for us, and uh, we, we really want to, to understand more how the work was organized, because on the Ostraka, we still have some uh, data about uh, wages, uh, even if they are really, really low. Uh, so we have to, to understand better uh, what was the kind of workers there. And finally, uh, concerning the excavated uh, area and zone, um, we, Béranger Redon and Laura Aguerre excavated sector 60, 33, uh, which is one of the largest sectors of the Planet village. Uh, we discovered there a large complex composed of 26 rooms in total that are arranged in three groups with also two phases of occupation. We have identified uh, many workspace and on the first floor of one room, 
made of clay was a circular pit around uh, 40 centimeters in diameter and in it was found uh, were found four uh, iron ingots around four kilo uh, each one uh, which has been probably left in situ uh, when the area was abandoned so to conclude uh, despite the intensive work carried out during the last three campaign, barely 50% of the village has been excavated. Uh, and given the wealth of material forms, the complexity of the organization and the differences between the village, at least two new campaigns will be needed to uncover the rest of the village. And there are still many things uh, to, to understand. Uh, discoveries made during excavation at the Samut uh, mining sites have already enabled us to compare uh, Agatha Kid texts with archaeological remains. We have a, a similar case at Goza uh, with the tools, with um, the, the count, uh, and this is something which is uh, which is much better in Goza than it was in Samut because we have uh, many more information about, uh, about uh, mining activities in the Ostraka. Uh, the data is still somewhat cryptic, but uh, I'm quite sure that uh, Laura uh, Aguer, who is working on the thing, will, uh, will give us new insights soon, I hope so. <laughs> And uh, concerning the dating of the village, we are quite sure that it's somewhere between 261 and 220, but we still have to refine it. Um, and I think I will have to stop, even if I had also something about the fort. I can just tell you no, that my, there my, is... Don't, don't worry, take your time. Okay, perfect. Uh, because I still have... Uh... 15 slides, so maybe I will have to, <laughs> to shorten. But um, yeah. Um, concerning uh, the, the fort, um, it's in the north of the village on a second alluvial terrace. It's uh, only dry stone, and uh, it's quite similar to the other Roman fort excavated by the mission. We completely excavated it uh, during the 2020 mission. Uh, the excavation was led by uh, Isabel Goncalves and Béranger Redon. And this uh, early Roman uh, fort uh, has allowed us to have a very good idea of why it was there and when it was built. Uh, it is quite modest in its size compared with other recent desert forts at the same period, which are often at least twice its size. Its main gateway and the probably associated rubbish dump uh, located uh, to the southeast corner have been taken away by uh, flooding. And uh, only uh, the, northeast, the northeast, uh postern has survived. A vast central courtyard gave access to around 15 rooms, all of which <clears throat> backed onto the curtain walls. The paucity of uh, the, 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 the paucity of the, the find inside the rooms and the limited amount of furniture found in most of them make it difficult to imagine the exact role and function of each room. But we still have uh, some uh, canon types uh, oven uh, found against the outer walls of the room, uh, as well as silos uh, marked by small low walls made of stone and unbaked earth, uh, uncooked and uh, un unfired uh, earth. Sorry. Uh, even, uh, even more uh, so than in the miners' village, we had a lot of grinding stone. Uh, used as a building and decorative stone, stones uh, in this area, as you can see there, for example. Um, concerning water, the fort has a, a good hydraulic system, in fact, uh, but without a well at the center. Here, the well uh, seems to have been several, uh, located several dozen meters from the fort at the confluence of two wadis, which would have been an ideal position, in fact, from an hydrological point of view. 
as it allowed it to be fed by both uh, the, the underground flow from the two valleys. And uh, it is connected by a long pipe, at least uh, 60 meter long, uh, to a cistern, uh, very well preserved, as you can see, uh, with, uh, in fact, this cistern and this pipe and all the system associated with that predates the uh, Roman fort and is linked with uh, gold processing during the uh, Ptolemaic period. And this is why the cistern is outside the fort. The well is outside the fort. In fact, they just reused uh, older, uh, older thing. Uh, an ostracon uh, found only after two days of excavation in 2020, uh, both name of uh, the site, Berkou, uh, and subsequently confirmed, uh, was subsequently confirmed by five other mentions of the same toponym. And the date for the construction, it's not exactly certain, but it's likely that the establishment of this fort has been linked with the installation of the road allowing a better exploitation of the Porfietes quarry. Uh, there was, uh, for example, in the account of uh, Giovanni Brocci in uh, 1823, the mention of fragment of porphyry on the road between Goza and the fort of Qatar, which is known to serve the Porphyrites road. road. Uh, the occupation seems to have been very short, uh, and the site has been abandoned according to poetry uh, diagnosis uh, at the end of the first century or very beginning of the second century AD. Uh, and the coin dating back to Vespasian uh, was found in the fort. It's, so it supports also this date. Although it may still have been in, uh, in circulation later. But this date I uh, supported by also two Ostraca bearing dates, respectively for the year 10 and uh, 11 of Domitian reigns, uh, so uh, 90 and 91 AD. It is likely that, uh, in fact, the road shift from uh, Goza Berku to Der El Atrash, which is uh, shorter, as you can see on the map, and also easier because there are less uh, soft sands, uh, which is better if you have heavy, heavy blocks to carry. And before leaving uh, Goza to the Fort of Dela Atrash, one uh, final point of, uh, of interest uh, is uh, found in the village. It's uh, an hydraulic structure, uh, which is in fact a kind of a protected wells. Uh, you can see it better on this uh, more recent satellite imagery. So you have a rubble heap, a huge ramp going to the shaft of the well. And uh, it has been suggested before that it was uh, a fear, so something to trap the water of the wadi, but in fact, the wadi is flowing from there to there. And so it's, uh, it's very unlikely that it has been used to take the wadi, uh, the wadi flood. And on the contrary, I did two test pits, one there and one there. And it shows that water from the wadi almost never comes there. It's mostly uh, aeolian in feelings, and so it is a protected wells which works very well, and it's probably uh, it has been probably made uh, in order to allow animals to going to go closer to the underground water surface, and to have less uh, work to take the water to the surface. But it's easier, in fact, to take the animals to the water than to take the water to the animals. Uh, even if it's longer at the beginning, but if you protect it well, you don't have any problem and it's lasted at least uh, since the Ptolemaic period because we are sure that it is Ptolemaic or earlier, thanks to the pottery finds we have in this area. Uh, and let's go to Der La Trash and let's move to this Roman fort. Um, there are trash uh, excavation were uh, made by uh, Joachim Le Beaumont and Julie Marchand. Uh, and uh, it's a uh, later fort. It's uh, a Roman and then a late Roman fort. It's large. Uh, it forms an irregular square with uh, sides measuring around 55 meters. 
It is flanked to the east by a series of low walls arranged in a rows in rows where activity was mainly limiting, uh, probably to keeping animals, what we sometimes call the animal lines. Uh, inside the fort, there is a large cistern uh, here and a huge well here with a smaller uh, well but deeper in this area. Um, the <clears throat> sorry the well may be much older than the fort but we we're not sure yet but we just did not find for now the rubble heap from the dredging or the the digging of the well we still have to <laughs> to find it uh in a way uh Joachim uh, Le Beaumont uh, excavated the, during the first year in 2020's uh, entrance system. Uh, and I will go quite, um, I will be quite quick because it's already late. There, they found this thing, this painting, um, a polychrome decoration that has for, for no, no equivalent in the Eastern Desert. Uh, the two towers flanking the gateway, uh, which are uh, large and uh, impressively, impressively large, in fact, built of mud brick and preserved to heights of almost five meters, uh, as well as part of the curtains are covered uh, with this painting. Uh, First, you have a layer of earthen plasters and Muna, and it's co covered with, uh, with the painting. The scene is divided into two registers separated by a thick red band underlined by an earthen band with geometric motif in the same color. In the upper register, a uh, rider is shown on a horse uh, surmounted by a snake on the left, while on the right, a caravan of at least four dromedaries is depicted two of which are held by the bridle of, uh, by a man on foot. The lower register features a wine motif. Uh, two later coarser edition depict a horse on one side and two dromed dromedaries on the other. Uh, Julie and uh, Joachim uh, in, uh, in uh, their last paper about that suggest that the figure of the riders on the snake uh, can be um, linked to what we call the Thracian horseman, uh, which is a protective genie particularly venerated in the Balkans, where it is often found on stelae on, or monumental uh, reliefs. Uh, this obviously uh, refers probably to the Thracian and Dacian prisons already well known in the Eastern Desert. Uh, ceramic datings provide two distinct occupation which probably correspond to the two phase of construction of the towers we found uh, so the the one with the painting and another more imposant and uh, square uh, so uh, the later phase is thought to have happened between the fourth and the fifth century AD while the earlier phase is thought to have taken place at the end of the first uh between the end of the first uh and the second century AD. The Ashoka corroborate uh this dating but do not provide for no the name of the site. Uh last image uh for um for uh, the Latrage just to show you exactly how it is so you have the well there here the uh deeper well we thought at the beginning that it was a modern one, but by doing a test pit, a test trench in this rubble heap from the small one, we saw that it is uh, an ancient one, in fact. Uh, so uh, we, all, we at least have two different uh, steps in the building of the, in the digging of the, of the well, even if it's not clear how it really uh, happens. Uh, and before finishing, a few words about uh, the Gaza district before and after the Greek Roman period. First, uh, before, 
the the new kingdom things uh we know we knew that there was some new kingdom settlements in the area because we were fi finding during survey mostly there is only one uh new kingdom grinding stone uh, in uh, goza fort but in on surveys we find uh, more and uh, the destruction of the site of Kaltelnaka, around eight kilometers to the south from uh, Goza. Uh, you can see the state of it in 2010 and in 2022. Uh, we found 16 uh, grinding stone uh, below this site, uh, which was uh, dated, which has been dated uh, by uh, Stephen Sainbottom and his team uh, from the Ptolemaic period. To the Ptolemaic period, we found uh, earlier occupation uh, below it uh, with uh, grinding stone as well as uh, New Kingdom uh, pottery. So, no, we know at least one site which we can study anymore, of course, unfortunately. And we also have some remains from uh, later, uh, after the recruitment period, with early medieval uh, hamlets. Uh, with a washing table, uh, which is well preserved, sorry, there, uh, and which we also tried to study. Uh, we already uh, do some mapping. Uh, we already did some mapping and some uh, pottery survey, but we will try to excavate at least one or two dwellings uh, next year to better understand what kind of occupation it was. Uh, and finally, we have no archaeological remains between the 9th or 10th century AD and the 19th century AD. We know uh, from uh, historical sources that from the late 17th, early 20th uh, century, uh, Maza Bedouins came in the area uh, and lived in the area. And then we have uh, no, a new peak in the occupation of the area with a new gold rush, uh, which is really strong in the area since 2017 and which became even harder in between 2020 and 2022. Uh, new cultivated fields also, exactly as I uh, show you, and uh, recently increased uh, pastoralism. And another kind of uh, economy also linked with, uh, with tourism. So uh, to conclude, we can see that this uh, region suffered from heavy danger uh, for the heritage, but in fact, it's just that it's still a living desert. And thank you for your attention.